Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and joining us today at our program, Understanding Russia at War. We have two special guests to South Campus today. They are both from the Southeast Campus faculty, Dr. Bradley Borjardi from the History Department and Oksana Nemirovsky from the Foreign Language Department. I will let them to introduce themselves and tell you why this topic is important for them. But before we start, I would like to give you a quick overview of today's program. Our speakers will tell you a little about what is going on with the current situation in Russia and the war between Russia and Ukraine. And you have an opportunity to ask questions by raising your hand. Now, let's give a big TCC welcome to our speakers. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Oksana Nemirovsky, and uh, I teach Spanish at Southeast Campus. So, um, I would love to teach Russian, nobody gave me this opportunity, so I'm teaching Spanish. Uh, well, I just want, I just want to say that uh, we are so happy to be here today and uh, uh, to have this conversation. Uh, and we plan this event with uh, Professor uh, Bradley Burgerdi as a discussion, as a conversation. Um, uh, we are happy to see people who are truly interested in this topic. And uh, um, I will uh, let uh, Professor Burgerdi to introduce himself and uh, to say a few words, and then I will talk about agenda, and we'll continue. Thank you. Yeah, hi, uh, my name is Bradley. I'm a history professor, as they said, at Southeast Campus. I've been there for 15, 16 years now. I got a PhD uh, from UTA, uh, and my main focus prior to graduating and getting a job teaching U.S. history was, was Russian history. So uh, I've been to Russia on a cultural exchange program in 2006 and have, have studied the uh, country and language for a while. Language not so much anymore as much as the history. Um, but I, I'm also a world historian who kind of like to draw, likes to draw parallels between the past and the present. So um, yeah, I'm here to answer whatever questions you have and give you some context of the historical situation that we're dealing with right now. Thank you, Bradley. And uh, I just want to say that uh, probably you're wondering why I'm here. I'm teaching Spanish. Uh, I'm originally from Latvia, but it used to be, well, it's a former Soviet Union, right? It used to be one country. I speak Russian. That's my native language. And uh, uh, also, what uh, I already mentioned that to Maria, that uh, ethnically my dad is Ukrainian, my mom is Russian, and uh, my heart is absolutely broken. Uh, so, um, since uh, this war began, I became uh, uh, obsessed with uh, news, with uh, looking into, trying to understand, trying to process, because it was such a huge shock for me. And I, uh, from the beginning, I really wanted to share and invite my Ukrainian friends, and they have many here. Uh, and uh, uh, to talk about that, and uh, again, for me, it began as a processing, uh, kind of um, like just processing uh, what's going on and trying to uh, understand and uh, trying to uh, probably do something. And uh, uh, that's how uh, we started with those events on uh, at Southeast uh, right after the war. Uh, and last semester, uh, Professor Burujerdi and I, uh, we had this presentation at uh, Southeast Campus about uh, Russian opposition, about Alexei Navalny. Uh, since then, uh, well, we have lots of development. We have elections in Russia. We, we have war that, well, is going. We have uh, more people who died. We have more refugees. 
so, uh, but to begin with uh, our conversation, I just want to put uh, uh, Russia and Ukraine on the map. Uh, and uh, I want to mention that uh, we have this agenda. We want to eventually cover geographical context, history, current co conflict, political climate in Russia, international uh, sanctions, uh, future prospects. But we can go uh, um, with your questions, with your interests. So please do not hesitate to interrupt, to ask questions, raise your hand, and. Uh, uh, let's uh, keep this conversation going. So, um, well, Russia and Ukraine. And uh, it used to be, um, well, as probably you know, uh, former Soviet Union was formed of uh, 15 federal republics. So we used to be one country uh, and, uh, well, uh, we are two different countries. Uh, well, I, I mean, we, I'm, I'm I'm from Latvia, so like we are 15 different countries, right? Um, so uh, in, on this map you can see actually um, all those areas that are now under Russian occupation. Uh, all, all those areas in Europe. Where are you from on the map? Can, are you on the map? Yes. I'm, uh, well, on the map, I'm not here, I'm uh, up there north, yes, I'm from Baltic, uh, well, I'm from Latvia, it's a Baltic state, and again, and it used to be part of Soviet Union, uh, so in Latvia, we speak Latvian, and we, like, lots of people speak Russian as well, uh, but uh, people from different uh, ethnical background, because, as probably you know, we speak uh, Russian not because we all exclusively ethnically Russians, but because it was one language that everyone spoke in addition to their uh, ethnical languages, uh, because it used to be one country. Um, well, questions so far? <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I mean, Russia, there's over 100 languages spoken in Russia today. Uh, there was a lot more than that under the Soviet Union. And, and I think one of the important points to make here is to understand that the Soviet Union was one of the largest experiments in human history in which they tried to break down national barriers, right? The Union of Soviet Soci Socialist Republics is different than, say, like the United States of America, which is a, is a nation state, you belong to the nation state, right? When the Twin Towers fall, you're a thousand miles away, you feel like you're under attack, right? You may not meet anybody in, in, uh, in, in New York City, but you feel like you're under attack, right? Well, I mean, it, the Soviet Union was about trying to, to, to break down these barriers that, that you know, your, net, your nation state doesn't matter as much as your class, where you're from, uh, how much money you got, uh, uh, where you're at in the, the social ladder. And so they oftentimes tried to go into these countries, take control uh, to liberate people, they would say. Um, but what ended up happening is they kind of fall into the same kind of national mentality by forcing people to learn Russian and things like this, right? And, and I think that's important because where Oksana's from, uh, this Baltic region, this is a new area, or the, one of the newest areas of NATO, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, right? Um, that used to be part of the Soviet Union. But one of the things that the Soviet Union, when it, when it came into existence, uh, it was struggling with Western countries, right? And one of the big problems that you see between nation state ideas of the United States of America and the Soviet Union, the anti-nation state idea, is a struggle between the two. And, and Russia had always been worried about people coming into their borders and invading and kind of like toppling the Soviet Union. And so when North Atlantic Treaty Organization, when NATO came about, you know, none of these Baltic states were part of NATO. They were part of the Soviet Union. Now that the Soviet Union falls, you see Western states moving in to former Soviet territory, causing alarm for Soviet leaders, right? If you think about the largest, most devastating invasions in world history, 
Many of them were in Russia, right? Uh, when the Nazis invaded, they came through the West and ended up and with a result of 20, 40 million people dying in, in Russia. I mean, one battle alone, more Russians died in war in World War II than all Americans have died in every single war that the United States has ever fought in from its existence, right? Uh, Napoleon invaded from the West, right? I mean, Russia's always been in, in, in concerned and worried about invasion. And, and this is something that I want, I want you to keep on your mind as we have a conversation when we get into what Vladimir Putin is using as justification for what he's doing here, right? Uh, he's preying, I think, on, on, on some fears that Russians have uh, when he's uh, doing these injustices that we're seeing happen. Go ahead. Yes, well, uh, starting uh, from the beginning, the beginning of the conflict, and probably not uh, uh, that many of you know that we are not, uh, well, we are talking about actually, well, uh, yes, we have uh, lots of history behind it, but uh, uh, I will leave it for uh, Professor Burgerdi to uh, talk about. I will start with uh, 2013 with uh, Euromaidan, and uh, when actually uh, lots of, uh, well, um, overall, people in Ukraine, uh, they wanted uh, this kind of European association. They wanted uh, to be part of Europe, and uh, uh, European Union, well, it's a long process, but, uh, well, process, but uh, uh, the president at the time uh, and the government, uh, they wanted uh, to have a very good relationship with Russia and it was one or another. So uh, people came to the streets, people came to protest, uh, protest especially younger people, uh, and uh, that's how this uh, revolution basically began. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, so this movement led to the uh, ousting of pro-Russian president. Uh, he was actually pro-Russian and uh, in February 2014. And uh, then uh, Russia responded right uh, after Olympic Games with the uh, annexation of Crimea. And Crimea, uh, again, Russia uh, claimed it's a uh, well, long history behind it, but Russia claimed uh, it being uh, historically Russian land uh, and uh, they uh, uh, they had so-called referendum there, uh, but uh, it's, uh, this area has been annexed by Russia since uh, 2014. Uh, and then Eastern Ukraine, in Eastern Ukraine, they have this war going on from 2014. I mean, actual war. And I have friends who flew uh, this conflict uh, before it uh, actually, be before Russia officially started bombarding Kyiv. Uh, they flew and uh, um, they had, uh, well, uh, very sad, well, very interesting and very sad stories to tell. Uh, we had this event right, uh, when uh, we invited uh, uh, people from Ukraine to share their personal experiences. Um, so let me, let me point out here real quick. Uh, you, you heard Oksana mention Kiev, right? It's the capital city uh, of the largest European country. I mean, that's what Ukraine is the largest European country. If we don't, if we don't include Russia as European, which I tend to not, Ukraine is the largest European country. Uh, the first Russian state that ever existed Keep this in mind, thousands of years ago, it was called the Kivan Rus. The Kivan Rus, right? So Kiev used to be the center of the first old Russian state. They didn't identify people 
as Ukrainian. Ukrainian is an identity that was created over centuries of people being displaced from areas of this enormous empire. I mean, today, Russia ain't even half as close as what it used to be thousands of years ago, and it spans 11 time zones. The United States will fit in there three different times. There's, it's enormous, right? So keep this in mind. The, the first, the origins of the Russian state were known as Kiev on Rus. Kiev was the capital. Right? There's a lot of old history that Russians associate with this being part of Russia. But as time goes on, as people move, get displaced, move around, develop their own identities, develop their own cultures, a, a, a new group of people start to emerge. At least 600 years ago, you can, five, 600 years ago, you can start to come with the creation of a Ukrainian type of identity from these people who were called Cossacks, who, who kind of made their way to this region, right? So this has been going on for a while. Once they got this identity, the Russian Empire forces themselves upon this area. After World War I, when the Bolshevik Revolution takes place, Ukraine is starting to try to become a nation, try to become its own independent nation. But the Soviet Union takes over, right? Uh, a lot of history goes on from 1917, when the Bolshevik Revolution emerges, all the way up till 1991, when the Soviet Union collapses. From 1917 to 1991, you have that big, great experiment, right? 1991, when they collapse, a lot of these countries, like Oksana was saying, some of them want to be more Europeanized, want to be more Westernized, want to be more liberal democracies, as opposed to totalitarian. And Ukraine was the first one to do this. They were the first ones to have a referendum to want to be part of this Western area, and it caused a lot of problems. Uh, Russia had handpicked their successor, had handpicked the leaders, and she, she called them pro-Russian. That, that, that was a nice way of saying that they were lackeys of the Russian Empire, essentially. Uh, and what, what, what ends up happening is the Ukrainian people rise up, overthrow these pro-Russian leaders, and try to establish their own government, which is where this war basically breaks out in. Yes, and uh, uh, what Russia wants there? Why she wants Ukraine? Uh, for uh, well, uh, it's a big question. It's a uh, and a very complex complex question. And uh, we uh, we should think about not only about uh, Russian ambitions uh, as a state, but uh, uh, personal ambitions of. Uh, it's president. Uh, so, and uh, it's a uh, very difficult, well, I <laughs> hear a lot of people discussing where uh, where it comes from, what's, uh, what's going on, why Ukraine, why they need this kind of, uh, to take over, why they need this influence, why they need to, what, uh, well, is it like proving something? Do you really need this land? Do you need this people? Do you need this energy? Why? And uh, uh, well, again, it's a kind of complex conversation. Um, uh, well, regional influence for sure. And Russia, uh, after Soviet Union collapse, uh, uh, well, I'm not saying Russia overall, but uh, especially all those KGB, former KGB agents, uh, they see themselves as, uh, uh, well, they have to restore this former power. Uh, and they see themselves as a missionary. It's a mission. And uh, I don't even think that uh, in terms of, uh, you know, uh, they have some kind of financial, like uh, economical gain there. It's uh, more about uh, um, political uh, ambition and influence and, uh, yes, well, maybe somehow energy, but uh, uh, mostly, uh, make a point uh, that's I agree. that's I agree. what uh, I but, but again uh, if you have uh, if you have opinion if you have questions if you want to add something to our conversation because uh, well it's a uh, it's a conversation that we would love to have with you. Yeah, feel free to stop us at any point in time when anybody's got a question, something doesn't make sense what we're saying, or you have a question, this is kind of informal, so don't worry about, you know, you can interrupt us, go ahead. So Ukraine is, Ukraine is more a focal point for Russia's like, expansion. Is it like 
Yeah, I would say is Ukraine a focal point of Russia's expansion? I think, you know, because Ukraine has so much ties to Russian history, Russians oftentimes feel like Ukraine isn't a country, that Ukraine is, is little Russia, that Ukraine belongs to Russia, that Ukraine has no right to go towards the West, where all these invasions have come from, from into Russia, all these devastating invasions have come from Russia, into Russia. They are worried about what happens when Ukraine, or even Georgia for that matter, remember when Georgia was about to be part, become part of, of, of NATO, they invaded, right? Um, uh, or Latvia, all of these areas that border Russia, Russia is very, uh, has a problem with either anybody, any of these countries going pro-Western or Westerners moving in towards their area. Ukraine, same as Latvia, used to be part, and most part of Ukraine, most, uh, well, Eastern Ukraine for sure, used to be part of Russian Empire. And I believe all this uh, imperial, uh, imperial, uh, imperial, uh, imperial, imperial ambitions, uh, you know, are very much alive, and uh, um, uh, well, with Latvia, it's a completely well different ethnicity and language, but Russians see uh, very uh, uh, tight, connect, uh, tight connection with uh, with Ukraine because they feel it's like oh, wow, we are the same. They are like the same people. We speak almost the same language, which is uh, not completely not true. <laughs> you know, uh, but uh, again, there is like a historical division uh, somehow also with Western Ukraine and Eastern Ukraine. Uh, in Eastern Ukraine, uh, they have more uh, people who speak Russian as uh, their native language, it doesn't mean that they do not feel they are Ukrainians, uh, that uh, they belong, it's been, you know, it is history, uh, but it's been a while. They've been uh, independent state uh, already for quite a while, and uh, Russian ambitions is just uh, to bring all those lands and all people uh, together, uh, well, I believe also kind of sick ambition of uh, uh, particular its president. Yeah, put, I mean, put, go ahead, go ahead. Because I'm wondering if he's trying to almost collect these countries that are wanting this independence as if he believes that he can get these individuals to fight his causes or go against America or whatever other small, smaller political spaces that he's trying to encompass. Like, I'm very much in the same lane as you trying to figure out his why. Yeah. Because he has such a dominance, even the way he's politicized the airways in Russia where people are not being fed the correct information to even begin any sort of uprising. So yeah, so uh, Putin is a lunatic. <laughs> <laughs> To, to, to be blunt, Putin is a lunatic. He's lost his mind. He's been um, in a silo and surrounded himself by yes men who don't want to criticize him. But you also have to put this into the context of the fact that Russians have always had an authoritarian leader. Like, the Tsarist regime, like the Romanov dynasty lasted from the 1680s to 1917. Then the Bolsheviks came over. They called themselves something different, but, but they were still totalitarian leaders, which ended with Stalin, the, long, the longest reigning leader in Russian history. Now, the Soviet Union falls. They got one leader named Boris Yeltsin, who was weak and, and looked very strange to people. He becomes a drunkard. And now you got Putin, who's been there ever since, who now just got reelected, supposedly 88%. Fifth time. Yeah, for his fifth time after suspending the Constitution multiple times. Now he's trying to one-up Stalin to be the longest reigning leader in Russian history. He is very power-hungry. He understands that if he 
gets out of office, there's going to be a lot of nefarious stuff that comes out about the amount of money that he's made, which what we talked about last last October was with Navalny, he, you know, Alexei Navalny, before they just killed him recently, had, had multiple documentaries, one of which called Putin's Palace, that shows the extent to which he's robbed the Russian people. And here, here's Putin walking around like he's a common man. He's got an apartment in his name, that's it. And he's got all this wealth, right? Uh, all this wealth that he's, he's accumulated, and he's silencing anyone who tries to expose any of his power-hungry accumulation of wealth that is, is a really big source of, of, of a lot of, I think, his dimension, I mean, his, his losing his mind is that, you know, he, he needed to protect uh, the, the, the corruption that he was involved in so much and he's been able to get away with these things. And, he, and when you allow somebody to get away with something like this, like when you feed a hungry bear barely any food, it's going to come at you for more, right? We saw this with Hitler. He, he, he tried to do all these different things, and people appeased him. And he just kept going and kept going. So I can do whatever I want now. I can do whatever I want now. And I feel like this is kind of the same situation that we see that Putin is in right now, where he keeps doing these things, keeps doing these things, uh, and he's getting condemned, a slap on the wrist, that's it. But he just keeps gaining more power and, and, and getting bigger and stronger. Uh, and uh, I honestly believe that uh, uh, Putin, he, uh, he believes in what he's doing. I, I don't think that uh, for him it's about corruption or, well, he, he is extremely wealthy. No, oh, wow. Well. But uh, I believe that uh, uh, he's a guy with a mission and uh, we uh, sometimes we uh, judge, um, we are trying to understand people from our perspective, uh, living in a democracy where uh, this kind of power is not possible. Well, hopefully it will not be possible. Uh, but, uh, and it is restricted in so many ways. Uh, in Russia, it's a direct line, you know, like uh, he has no uh, restriction there. He has no uh, institu uh, institutes to, uh, to restrict his, uh, his will, his move. And he built uh, basically this, uh, he's building this empire from scratch again. Uh, yeah. Yeah, glory, power, um, he's building it up. He, he, he thinks he's the savior. Uh, the, the, the notion of a strong man needing to come and contain order. I mean, think about it. Like the very first piece of literature that we have that exists in Russian history is the, the tale of Prince Igor, which is about an invasion from outsiders to destroy Russia, and the great prince comes and saves everyone. Right? Um, Stalin did the same thing. Uh, the people who Stalin admired uh, are the same people that Putin admires. He's trying to kind of make himself similar to like uh, you know, Nicholas, the, Nicholas I, who was a very strong authoritarian terror to bizarre, who did these types of things to people as well and, and get away with it, right? Um, so it's unfortunate, and, and, and we have to be weary about this. this. This is important to us, right? I mean, we've heard people say, you know, injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. And I, and I feel like this is a good example of that because we can get weary by what's going on over here. It's not a big deal, but I mean, for us, but geopolitical struggles between what used to be the two greatest world superpowers, the United States and the Soviet Union, never really ended. I mean, the Cold War, in my opinion, never really ended. This is just the next iteration of the Cold War. We, we, we called it something different, but Putin's been talking about like this forever. I mean, in, 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 in Bush II's uh, administration, 2008, he, he, he disparaged Ukraine, called it little Ukraine. Um, he's been doing, exactly, been doing this stuff for a while, you know, and he's been planning, I think, very deliberately. When I was in Russia in 2006, it was very interesting. They had gone through what we call a de-Stalinization period. When, when Khrushchev took over after Stalin died, they started, like, exposing the world to what crimes Stalin had done. And his reputation has started to drastically decline. Meanwhile, Putin, this KGB operative who runs in the, is very calculative in planning, all of a sudden they're going to the streets. I didn't know this now. I mean, I didn't know this then, but in hindsight, it, it makes sense. 
I'd go to all these kiosks and these places and there'd be Stalin shirts, Stalin mugs. He was re, he was re kind of like, um, uh, re, re resurrecting Stalin's image and the need to have this strong, powerful leader right before he then goes off and starts to do the same thing, right? I think he's been planning this very, for a very long time. Yes, well, I want to go back to this uh, war and uh, just mention a few facts. And uh, we are talking about, well, uh, so, uh, well, such a uh, human suffering. And uh, it's, uh, uh, well, talking about dead and injured, uh, well, it's very, uh, it's very difficult to find uh, real statistics uh, because, uh, um, uh, both Kiev and Moscow, uh, they hide their casualties. Uh, uh, well, uh, it's, uh, they just keep it secret uh, because of the effect they might have on their uh, morale or uh, their army and uh, also population at home. So it's uh, very difficult to find a statistic, but uh, well, according to well, the recent data from the United States in Ukraine, it's about 500,000 people. So I'm not sure if we should believe this number, but uh, also so many people fled, uh, fled refugees uh, from, especially from Eastern Ukraine. Uh, some people are coming back home, then fleeing again. I know what's going on because Latvia became a huge hub for uh, Ukrainian refugees and for uh, Russian refugees as well. Those who uh, are trying to uh, flee from mobilization, but also uh, from uh, incarceration, like uh, um, opposition. Uh, so, um, displaced. Okay. Uh, well, uh, people mostly go to uh, uh, European countries, mostly to uh, Poland and uh, Hungary and Romania and uh, like Baltic states as well uh, took uh, lots of uh, refugees and they have a program for Ukrainian re refugees. Uh, lots of people go to Germany, to England, well, well Great Britain. Um, so uh, it depends. Some uh, came here and uh, there is a special visa, but uh, it is very difficult. It is very difficult, and uh, I know that uh, in Latvia, lots of people went back to Ukraine. Uh, as soon as situation allows, people go back. They're trying to build their, their lives. And it's so uh, hard to plan. It's uh, uh, especially for people fleeing from Eastern Ukraine. Um, um, yes, uh, international support. Uh, I just want to mention, probably, you know, what's going on. Maybe you want to take over. It's uh, what's going on right now in the Congress with uh, uh, this support for Ukraine, and it's uh, very unfortunate. But, uh, well, Ukraine got lots of support, and uh, they've been, they were able to resist. They were able to fight uh, Russian troops because of this support. Um, but uh, un uh, unless we help, unless we support, Putin uh, will take over, you know, and he will, uh, even if uh, there, will, there will be eventually peace agreement, but on his conditions. So it really, uh, it's uh, such a hard situation now, very difficult situation right now, and uh, in uh, front. Yeah, I mean, history shows us, right, if you feed a hungry dictator, they don't become satisfied. If you, if, you, if you feed them what they want, they want more. I mean, you got to look through history, right? I mean, everything has a history. And if you want to understand the historical problem, you need to understand the history. And this is a big problem. we got politicians who don't understand history. Putin himself, who, who thinks he's a historian, talking all this oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, uh, uh, I mean, it's ridiculous. But, but even in the United States. You know, when, when you got like, you know, businessmen, and people who, who know nothing about history, who never took a history class in their life, uh, making decisions about history, you're gonna, you're gonna have problems. 
So if you want to have an opinion on this stuff here, you need to have some history. And, and if we're being honest, it, take, it's, it, it takes at least a year of a, of a history class, a basic history class from Russia since 1855, as well as Russia before 1855, with the big Crimean War that, that caused a lot of issues. And, and, and to me, this is very important. We don't, but we don't want to take the time to, 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 to study the history. We just want the immediate effects. And you can have these politicians who say things in flashy ways, and, and people buy into it. But you have to understand the history. And, and this is one of the biggest problems we have, because you know, fighting this war for Ukraine is a war that people who enjoy freedom, people who love the notion of freedom, should be paying close attention to, right? Yeah, it sucks. We, we got to pay for wars like this. We don't have to pay for wars like this all the time. You, you shouldn't equate, for example, a war in Afghanistan that we spent a lot of time in, or a war in Iraq that we spent a lot of time in, with this war. Politicians try to make you think that they're the same thing. Not all foreign wars are worth fighting, but this is something that's different here. Um, what, what, what I would say is that NATO needs to show some courage and allow Ukraine in. Um, which they don't want to do because that's scary. But the president of France recently, you know, Macron mentioned that he would he wasn't uh, opposed to putting troops in Ukraine, and everybody was upset by that. But you know who wasn't upset about it? Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, the Baltic states that know exactly what's going to happen once Ukraine becomes part of Russia. They're next. Right? What, 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 what's going to happen is Russia's going to restore order from the former Soviet Union. And like what the Soviet Union wanted to try to do, at least in name, they tried to say they wanted to expand and create this world revolution. But it, it becomes power, right? They, they weren't communists. We, we think of the Soviet Union as communism. Communism is no government at all. Government doesn't exist. People have learned to live in such a way that we don't need government anymore. But what happened under the Soviet Union? The government got bigger and bigger and bigger and stronger and more powerful. And power was accumulated in the hands of what, what, what ended up being state-run capitalism. Putin's going to do the same thing. If you study the, the history of it, he's, he's using Russian fears of invasion, using Russian trauma. Because Russian people have tremendous trauma, man. They've been destroyed multiple times. And he uses history. Like, for example, when Macron said that, that comment, Putin comes back and says, if, 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 if France comes into Russia, then they're going to meet the same fate as Napoleon. This is an asinine comment that has nothing to do with history. If you study why Napoleon went to where he was versus why Macron is saying what he's saying, he, he's distorting history in a way that's preying on Russian people's fears. And that, that's one of the problems, too. If we want to be real frank about the situation, you know, Russians have a bit of responsibility here because they can't or, or fear rising up against the government. But that's understandable because the type of thing that happens to you when you when you rise up against the government in Russia is a lot different than what happens to you when you rise up against the government in the United States. But see, why do they not, so who was the gentleman, I can't think of his name right now, who was fighting very proactively for Putin? And he recently was, in my opinion, assassinated as well. Oh. All uh, Prigozhin. Prigozhin. Okay. Prigozhin. So if you Prigozhin. can see through him, and I think he really should, Putin, honestly. When he had okay. those troops go through and march into that sure. city, and you saw the excitement and the uprising from the people. Well, I mean, this, is a good, this is a great point when you talk about this, because I would say, and you're right, Putin was scared of this. But you notice he never once said Navalny's name in public until Navalny died. He wasn't scared of Navalny. Navalny was about free elections, was about liberal democracy. Prigozhin is another henchman. He's another uh, mass murderer who was going to take over and be next Putin. If a toppling of Putin happens in Russia, in my opinion, it's going to be another strong person who comes over and dominates. Because Russians are used to this type of of behavior. And yeah, people were, were rallying him on, and he's a strong guy, and, and it's going to be the same thing. But, but, but what happens to Navalny 
He doesn't even mention the guy's name. He just, it's like, who is this so-called so person saying these things? Because he knows that the threat isn't that imminent because Russians don't go out and fight like, you know, Americans do because there's all these famous sayings. I, remember, I can't remember how, but it's sort of like, you know, if there's a crowd, you don't stick your head up in the crowd because it'll get chopped off, right? Uh, you, you, you just sort of lay low. Like, even when I was there, I, I stayed with a lot of rich people. I stayed with a lot of poor people. And, and the rich people would always say, you're fine in Russia. No problem as long as you're not a journalist, as long as you don't criticize the government. They'll leave you alone. You just do your business, do your thing. They won't bother you. Um, and, and there is this sort of kind of nonchalant way of, look, we just want to live, and, and, and they're very nihilistic when it comes to these types of things. But as time goes on, this can, this can cause problems, right? Yes, and uh, actually, uh, uh, yes, we were uh, going to mention uh, current political climate in Russia and Russian opposition, but uh, uh, talking about popularity of Navalny, to be honest, well, he was popular among certain uh, uh, like circles of people, but mostly uh, th this common understanding among Russians that it's such a huge country with uh, um, so many different uh, nationalities and religions and, uh, and uh, to keep it together, I don't know who needs to keep it all together, but uh, to keep it together, uh, they need a strong leader and uh, they do not see any alternative. They do not see uh, uh, and uh, I honestly, I don't believe that even with free elections that Alexei Navalny had a chance today. Uh, I don't think so. And uh, yes, uh, there is a lot of uh, uh, tension and uh, uh, authoritarian practices and uh, lots of people. This is Alexei Navalny. Uh, killed in prison. You know, when we say killed, we cannot prove that he was literally killed. He was poisoned before, uh, but he was uh, placed in such conditions that even if they didn't kill him physically, it was literally, it was a kill. Um, but uh, we have uh, lots of prominent uh, opposition leaders who uh, like very outspoken. Uh, uh, well, for example, well here in the middle, um, uh, Karmurza. He is uh, uh, well. Uh, he's dying right now in prison, and uh, he's been poisoned before. Also, probably well. Poisoning his opponents, it's uh, Putin's favorite uh, way to deal with uh, uh, opposition. Uh, we have uh, Lyubov Sobolyva, uh, we, we have Ilya Yashin, we have people who are uh, dying in uh, prison right now, but uh, at the same time, we cannot say that there is such a movement, a position movement in Russia. But also, we have to keep in mind that right now, even if you stay stand outside with a sign "No War" uh, or even uh, "No" and blank, uh, you you are in trouble. Uh, so. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's true. You, you, you see the drastic, drastic transformation. Like, you know, I guess the best, the best likening I can think of is the George Floyd protests. Look at the uprising that that, that, that created for a while. I mean, in the United States, we, have, we, we oftentimes have, a, have an op, we have this tendency to kind of like rise up about something and then after a while go about our, our business and, and forget about it. Um, but if you take that exact same situation, those people in the streets in, in Russia, everybody's going to be arrested and, 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 and beaten and, and brutalized and, and many killed uh, and families not ever seeing each other again. I mean, think about this. So, so Stalin, when Stalin was at his height of his power, he killed so many people. He didn't just kill you. If, if there was a photograph of you, he would have you airbrushed out of the photograph. And, and if there was a book that mentioned your name, you have the book re reprinted with you out of it. Like, these types of things have been going on for a long time. And, you know, culturally, Americans were born out of protest. We were born out of uh, black market activity, right? Doing business against the law and defying the government and then creating this culture of defiance. Russia is different. It's different. That's not to say that there aren't people fighting. Like she says, there are people fighting 
uh, at great cost to their life. And, and I think that's what Navalny knew. I think great, Navalny knows. He said, I'm going to have to die, and a lot more people like me are going to have to come up and die before people start waking up. But it's not going to work unless we don't. That's why I would, I would, I would, I would like him to like the Russian Nelson Mandela if he would have survived this. But he, he didn't because there's not enough. Like in this, in this last election here, 88% very garbage. Uh, it's good. High, high, this high, number is yeah. yeah. Even even actually, I would say that this shows that Putin is still a little weary because he's never fudged it that much. At the most, it's been like seventy-seven. But you'll notice there there was a protest where people turned in ballots that were deliberately messed up, so so it could show signs that we are the ones who are voting for Navalny. So we're going to turn in blank ballots. We're going to turn in a ballot that shows that it's messed up, so it'll show up that this was a blank ba ballot. That was one point seven million. How many people are in Russia? Almost. 500, 400 million? I can't remember. Let's Google. There's a lot of people. Two, two, three hundred million people in Russia. Uh, you know, 1.7 million. That's a lot of people. But it's nowhere close to what you need for the Balinese revolution to be successful. You know. Well, uh, for this election, they had uh, initially uh, um, a candidate uh, like so-called anti-war. He was uh, very much pro-Russian pro government, but uh, at least in his agenda, he was against the war and for peace uh, with Ukraine. And they uh, they had huge lines for people, you know, because you have to collect signatures to be registered officially to be uh, opponent of Putin during elections. Uh, and uh, uh, lines, uh, people lined, you know, to uh, to leave signatures. At least it was uh, kind of uh, officially um, uh, accepted form of protest. But then they didn't register him. They said that uh, all those like lots of signatures are fake. Um, so uh, yeah, well, those numbers. But still, uh, uh, I believe uh, that. Putin won, honestly, maybe with, uh, I don't know, 55, 60%, uh, but, uh, uh, and uh, we, we want to mention, I don't know how much time we have, propaganda. Uh, Russian propaganda, it's one of a kind. Guys, this is, uh, like, 10 minutes? 10 minutes. Uh, uh, this is absolutely important. And uh, you know, sometimes I'm trying to figure out what's going on and how it happened. How these people, because I have so many friends in Moscow, I graduated from um, uh, Moscow University, People's Friendship University, it's like famous Lumumba. Uh, so oh, I have lots of friends in all kind of um, circles and very high there in like Russian elite uh, and, uh, and former friends. Uh, and I'm trying to understand how, how, how it is, well, I lived in Moscow for 11 years, how it is possible, it's, it's, it's not possible. Um, uh, and uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's absolutely amazing, you know, I'm watching their first channel, first channel, it's like famous, <laughs> well, government channel, basically everything belongs to government, but uh, this one, and uh, after listening for an hour, you kind of feel well, yeah, well, uh, we want world with uh, uh, two, uh, like, uh, two polar, wo how do they call it, like, two poles, you know, like, uh, yeah, uh, and uh, uh, all this propaganda about, uh, actually, Nazis uh, in the Ukraine, uh, all, uh, it's, uh, they, uh, like, people there live in, uh, um, made up uh, world, uh, it's uh, something absolutely, uh, uh, something upside down. So, uh, and uh, the, uh, they completely believe in it. Uh, they uh, they uh, fight, uh, they are good people. They fight for good people in Ukraine. They want to, well, liberate uh, poor Russian speakers in Ukraine, and Eastern Ukraine, who needs that, their help. They, uh, they also, they kind of believe this uh, lunatic. Uh, uh, they are people with a mission, mostly. Uh, well, some go to this army because they pay a lot. Uh, he pays uh, a lot to mobilize, you know, to his troops. But uh, Russian propaganda is uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, like a piece of art. Yeah, and propaganda works best when you appeal to something that 
tugs at some heartstrings that people have dealt with. So like because the Nazi invasion of Russia was such an existential threat, because 27 million soldiers, not even to account civilians, died when the Nazis invaded, sneak attacked them. The word Nazi is very charging for Russians. I mean, I remember when I went to what is today Volgograd, it was called Stalingrad, the Battle of Stalingrad. They tell me, are you American? First thing I want to say, you want to know why, you know, let me tell you how we saved you from the Nazis, right? I mean, everything, the whole city is a memorial because the whole city was destroyed by, by, Russia, by, by, by the Nazis. They, they want everyone to know how they saved the world from Nazism, and rightly so, they did. But because there are so many of these older generations, like I met an 80 year old man who would look me in the face and say, if you died under Stalin, Stalin killed you, you deserved it because there's nothing that's gonna change my mind because I sacrificed my whole entire life for this man. And if I admit that it was wrong, what does that say maybe about my life? Like, you, you know, propaganda works on people who've had so much pain, so much struggle. I mean, to give you a good example for me, like I remember growing up, when I was a kid, my mom used to be a baby, she used to babysit kids. She babysit too many kids. She wasn't supposed to be doing it. And the, and the government would come in and like check, see how many kids she had. She stuffed us, stuffed us under the bed. And, and I remember like seeing, seeing people walking and like my heart be pounding, like, oh God, they're gonna catch me. Uh, now, what's gonna happen? I'd be so worried. And so growing up my whole life, every time I encountered with police or authorities, I would feel these types of ways. I would feel strained. I, I, I never fit really well. And so when somebody comes and tells me about police brutality, I'm, I'm automatically on it. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm, I had a tendency to judge police before. All police are bad in my mind. All police were bad because I felt these types of things. So if you showed me, a, if you showed me an image of a police officer running and then I don't see the rest, and then somebody dies right here, my, my mind would make the uh, assumption that the police officer killed him without knowing it because these feelings would make my mind draw conclusions that I didn't actually know to be true. Maybe, maybe they weren't true. Maybe there were some police officers who were there to try to help me, but I didn't know because I didn't think of them in that way. It automatically made me think these types of way, right? Propaganda works on people who have these feelings? If, if you if you can know if, if you know someone struggles with something in their life, then then you can use tactics to appeal to a certain thing that will highlight them and make them see more of something than really there may be. Could this will be my last question. I'm sorry. Oh, absolutely. So when it comes to the propaganda in regards to Russian parents whose sons, at this point, from what I understand, are basically being taken to war, they're not volunteering any longer. Yeah. to be a part of this war. But then you'll see journalists who are brave enough to go and ask these parents, well, what is Putin showing you that lets you know your son is either alive or that this cause is just? Because half of them don't even seem to be aware of the status of their child. Some of them are dead and have not had any true burials. How are the parents able to continue with that narrative when what he's showing on television is not equating what they're receiving in regards to how they're told about their child. Yeah, it's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. Uh, and, uh, uh, well, uh, they mobilize lots of people, but mostly not like, uh, not, um, I'm not sure how to say it in uh, English, all those drafts, you know, like when they call young people, uh, uh, they had to actually sign the contract. So it wasn't like, it. Uh, well, it, lots of pressure, of course, but it's not like they uh, placed all those like uh, 18 years old and sent them to, um, uh, to the war like uh, without uh, previous steps. So, uh, uh, and uh, mostly people who actually signed the contract they well, they agree on, uh, uh, and it's uh, it, it, it is su surprising that uh, uh, even uh, mobilization and they mobilized almost as many people as during World War II. Uh, so uh, it is surprising that uh, there is no uh, significant effect, you know, and uh, mostly, 
people's opinion is uh, we are, uh, well, our sons, our brothers, our husbands, they are here, they are defending our countries from Nazis. And from, uh, from NATO, from Western, uh, from Western uh, power that would want to destroy Russia. I would like to add to that that a lot of uh, people who fight uh, for Russia, they were prisoners. When mm -hmm. Wagner was uh, yeah. the leader, military it's leader, very good point. he uh, went to prisons and he said, uh, you, can, you can leave prison today if you come to fight this mm -hmm. war and uh, after, uh, afterwards you will be all mm -hmm. free. All laws were banned, you know, and uh, uh, now basically prisons are empty because they give uh, uh, like former uh, uh, killers and uh, well, all sorts of criminals, uh, 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 rapists and uh, everyone, you know, uh, they give them an option. Uh, you go, join and uh, you will be paid. You will be, and uh, they're paying very well, I mean, yeah, uh, uh, and uh, you will be free. I mean, I mean, it should be just like a, a mafia. I mean, the government in Russia is like the mafia is controlling the society, right? I mean, we've seen this happen, yeah. you know, in, in, in many areas before. Um, you know, when, when you let, when you glorify, you know, pain and, and, and death, uh, and you suppress dissent, that that's the worst combination to try to get people to come out and speak, right? Um, you know, not to mention the fact that these parents, you know, their their grandparents, uh, you know, the, one out of every six or seven men in, in Russia from age 18 to, to, to 25 uh, during the early Bolshevik Revolution period died. So, like, these parents, they, they come from family families that, that have seen that death. Um, and you know, this notion of, of sacrificing for, for the greater good has always been part of, of the philosophy. I just want to show you some pictures from our previous, uh, uh, previous conversations. And uh, 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 Kiev, Chernovtsi, this is Ukraine, and this is um, Kharkov, before invasion and after. Uh, uh, by the way, Kharkov is one of the largest Russian-speaking cities uh, in the world. Uh, because in this part of Ukraine, uh, they mostly speak Russian, and that's what uh, uh, Russian troops, uh, like uh, li liberators, what they did. That's... Which also remember, you know, when, 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 when Hitler was, was justifying his expansion, what did he say? We need to go where there are Russian speakers to protect Russian speakers. Russia's doing the same thing here, right? We need to go into Ukraine because there are these Russian speakers and this is Russian history and these Nazis are, are taking, destroying, you know. And uh, I want, uh, that's how we ended our presentation right after war began, that it's a battle between good and evil and uh, I strongly believe in it. Um, and uh, I believe that it's uh, absolutely existential. Uh, we see it as some conflict in uh, uh, Eastern Europe uh, that, uh, well, uh, we feel for these people. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I believe, uh, I personally believe that uh, it is uh, um, existential for the United States. Yeah. I think that's it. That's good. Thank you all for coming. If you have any questions, we'll be here. If you have any questions, you're welcome to ask any. Or, or um, if you need a contact information, we can send you the contact information to our speakers. So if you are um, not sure what question to ask or not, um, you are welcome to send them the email. Uh, well, thank you so much, Ms. Oksana Nemirovsky and Dr. Bradley um, Boro sure. Jared, there you go. for coming to us today, for sharing your time and for your expertise and talking to us about this important, very important topic today to us as well. So uh, thank you so much. We really appreciate you. Thank you.